Clear and prop. Tower 73, Cherokee number 2, following twin traffic, 3 mile final. There's nothing to do. One Charlie Bravo, makes for in runway 25, going uh, 4 mile final. This is Behind the Prop with United Flight Systems owner and licensed pilot Bobby Doss and his co host, major airline captain and designated pilot examiner Wally Mulhern. Now let's go Behind the Prop. What's up, Wally? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I'm good. This is a show that I think. Might blow off our top 10 charts, hopefully. Um, this is going to be a new series that we're going to start doing every month called Check Ride Turbulence. And that's a little bit of a play on the words, Check Ride and Turbulence. But these are going to be stories from a flight school owner and a DPE to make the check ride a little less bumpier. To, we're going to help people smooth those flights out and those check rides out. Um, and this week, we're going to start with preparing for the check ride. And if you have check ride stories and ideas you want us to do as part of this check ride turbulence every month show, let us know. But this month is all about preparation for the check ride. Wally, I'm sure you've seen just about everything in your first 450 check rides. But on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most prepared student that you've ever had, that would have been me probably on the instrument check. Uh, of course. <laughs> What would you say the average level of preparation is for a check ride? I would say um, somewhere around a, a seven. So not bad, right? But just short of seventy percent is normally a failing grade, right? Right. And so seven's still not really, really good, right? For professional pilots or people who want to do something or partake in something that could be dangerous, we right. want we want to shoot for better than seven. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I, go ahead. Uh, I you know it it's it it all goes back to um preparation and at least with me um I have an online uh, scheduling system if you if you book a check ride with me you're going to get a, an email confirmation and along with that email confirmation is going to be a letter. Uh it's the letter is is just over a page long. And there's a lot of information on the letter. And if you use that letter basically as a checklist, you're going to be in pretty good shape. I know several of the uh, other examiners here in Houston use the same type of system where you, you book it online and, and you will get a confirmation. Um, what what I see is is the, the farther out in advance that we can schedule a check ride and the far, farther out in uh, before the check ride that the student or the applicant is actually signed off in IACRA, the better. I would guess that probably 50% of applicants um, uh, before we even uh, meet, I find in some sort of missing something or other on the application, the IACRA application itself. And it usually has to do with the flight times. Uh, there's a little column uh, for class totals and it's PIC, uh, class totals. And, um, a lot of people miss that. So, uh, you know, maybe it's a private pilot candidate and they've got 7.9 hours of solo time and, um, uh, or, or, or actually that'd be cross country. Let's say they got 12 hours of solo time. They should have in that class totals, they should have 12 hours of, 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 single engine land PIC time. And a lot of times they, they miss that. And those are really easy things to fix because as I'm, I'm sitting at home relaxing in the evening, I'm, I'm looking a week ahead of time and I'm pulling up applications and I'm taking a look at things and I'm, I'm looking at the numbers on these applications. And if I see that, uh, it's real simple for me to go into my scheduling system and send you a text, say, Hey, I was looking at your application. I noticed you left out a column. I'm going to send it back to you right now. And um, it's no big deal. It's absolutely no big deal. You know, I deal with IACRA daily. Um, I've I've dealt with it on, on hundreds of applications. And um, as a student pilot, this may be your, your second time to really deal with the IACRA, the first time being when you got your student pilot certificate. And now you're working towards your private. And even the CFIs aren't. Uh, extremely familiar with IACRA. So, you know, I, I kind of know what things to look for. I'm looking for to meet the minimum requirements, making sure there's three hours of inch. And we're talking about private uh, and we're talking about part 61. 
uh, making sure there's three hours of instrument, three hours of nighttime. Um, you know, a lot of times you will see uh, um, them putting in the application that they have PIC night landings, which most of the time at this point, um, uh, the, a student pilot would not have that. And uh, unless we're talking about uh, simulator time, solo time plus dual time should equal total time. So um, a lot of times I'll see, um, you know, uh, tenth errors, um, um, you know, uh, 12 hours of solo time, uh, 50 hours of dual time, and total time is 72 hours, uh, where it would be 62 hours. So, you know, I'll, I'll kind of make a, a, a mental audit or a, a quick audit of the times to make sure they make sense. And again, I would say probably 45% of the applications I get before I ever even meet the applicant, um, I find some errors and we're able to fix that. So that's probably the first thing. And, you know, obviously if the application is done the day before, um, sometimes it's not as easy to um, see those errors. And, and then the morning of the check ride or the afternoon of the check ride, we're trying to fix these things. And I, I see the anxiety level on the applicant raising as they're dealing with this. They, they're thinking, oh my gosh, I've, I've made the examiner mad, which isn't the case at all. I mean, I just want to get it right. Yeah. And so 70% just is not good enough. Wally just shared a lot of things that he sees before he even meets applicants um, that really does show a lack of prepar preparation and preparing for the check ride. So we're going to give a number of things today that should help you prepare for your check ride. We're going to talk a lot about preparing yourself, uh, which was a lot of what Wally just shared, and I think your CFI can help you with it, but you're pilot in command here. You've you got to own your check ride. We're going to talk about qualifying and, and making sure things are ready and, and, and good to go with the aircraft that you're going to use. Uh, and then share a few best practices along the way as well. And uh, if you do these things, I hate to ask Wally, but how much better is it going to look when they sit down with you and they're really well prepared? It's it's a, a very much a better look. Um, you know, I I will bend over backwards to work with the applicant to make make uh, make the check ride happen. But, um, you know, before we can even start the check ride, uh, we are required to qualify A, the applicant, and B, qualify the airplane. So we go in there and we say, okay, do we have a legal and qualified applicant? In other words, do you meet all the requirements? Let's take a look at your cross-country flights. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug the numbers in into ForeFlight and make sure that uh, you meet the leg distance requirements. Um, I'm going to look, if it's an instrument cross-country, I'm going to make sure that the you did three different type approaches. If you did your cross-country and they're all R&AV approaches, well, I'm sorry, that, that doesn't meet the requirement. So we're not even going to technically get started. The, the check ride is not even going to start. Um, so we've got uh, qualifying the applicant. And of course, that's um, making sure you have a, a valid government issued ID, um, a pilot certificate, a medical certificate, appropriate logbook endorsements, um, uh, appropriate ground school uh, logged. Um, I had a young man a couple years ago show up with a, a driver's license for his ID that expired three months ago. And, um, you know, he he thought I was being a little ridiculous by not allowing it. And, and then when I showed him that uh, when I even plugged the numbers into the computer system, it, it said, no, it, not qualified. You, know, you can't do this. So um, he had to come back another day and, um, you know, waste of my time, waste of his time. And uh, away, you know, there, there's somebody out there who would have liked to have had the check ride that day that, that didn't get the check ride. So, so there's a lot of stuff and, and, we talked a little bit before we started recording. Maybe maybe behind the prop comes up with the best doggone checklist ever for, for check rides because this should be super simple for, for students and CFIs to put this together and share it. You obviously need all these documents. Yes. So, again, I'll go back to – and I, I'm, I'm trying to be a little facetious, but if I came to you for a check ride and, and you came to my 
the the room that I'm in, and my drive my non expired driver's license was laying on the table. My a student pilot was laying on pilot's license was laying on the table. My IACRA eighty seven ten was laid out on the table, all accurate and verified. I had um everything that you would need to ask me of personally for my my person laid out. Logbook was maybe tabbed out with a logbook audit form that said I did my three night did my three hours of night on these two flights. They're the two blue tabs if you want to look at my logbook and see them. My long cross countries are in the red tabs in my logbook. And here's the verification that it, they meet the requirements. A, a cheat sheet like that. All these things laid out. We're going to have a pretty good start to our check ride. We are. Yeah. I mean, first impression um, that, that when I see that and, um, you know, if it's a morning check ride, uh, breakfast tacos are no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, he's uh, not. <laughs> uh, uh, donuts work too. Um, no, I'm uh, in, in all seriousness. When I when I do walk in and I see that, I'm I'm very impressed. Um, and it it's it's just a very good first impression. It's like um, you know uh, uh, going to buy a new car if if the car is all clean and shiny and all vacuumed out, you're probably much more inclined to buy that car than if it's all muddy and uh, there's mud inside it. So um, um, uh, I w- when I see that I, I do smile and think. My first thought is okay. Uh, not not that I'm biased or anything, but um, it is a nice way to start the day. Yeah, so I highly recommend and, and say to everyone that um, you should you should audit your logbook and make sure you meet all the requirements. Don't just trust your CFI. I, I've heard horror stories. Wally, you've told me horror stories of everything being accomplished except point one of something. Yeah, it was a miscalculation. It was an oversight. It was yeah. uh, they 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 maybe they did ten landings over two nights at controlled out airports. But they wrote down four and they wrote down five and you've you've now spot checked it and you count nine. That's one landing shy of the requirements. Right. Are you able to finish that check ride? Uh, no. I mean, well, we're not even able to start yeah, the check so ride. You so can't even begin. You, you, you can't even begin until we log into IACRA and the applicant signs the check ride and we go through all the um, re- required processes there. Um, the, the check ride doesn't even begin. Um I I had one recently where um, the the student pilot um, only had two takeoffs and landings at a controlled airport, solo takeoffs and landings at a controlled airport, and and uh, the requirement is three, and so uh, I sat around while he went out at this particular airport, which was a controlled airport. He had come in with his CFI, and he went around and and did a lap in the pattern. And then he came back and logged it, and I said, "Okay, now you have three, so now we can begin." And you know that that whole process took forty five minutes, um, and I could tell when he got back in, he was he was a little shaken up, and um, uh, you know it. Uh, you want to be relaxed. You want to just have all your ducks in a row, and uh, be ready to go. Yeah, I, I I remember that day, and I remember being prepared. But I I I get how much information there is, and how maybe we're not able to do it on our own as a private pilot yet. But man, seek help to have someone else review your information with you. Don't wait till you're meeting a DPE for the first time to realize it's either all there or not all there. Um, do the inspection and use some of the tools. We'll we will commit to getting a checklist out there and maybe some logbook audit forms. Uh, to help the listeners as well, uh, if you keep inviting people to listen to the show, but it it's not that difficult. It takes the time to prepare to get it done. So now we've 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 qualified the applicant. We've we've meet all the requirements for whichever check ride we're doing. We have all of our legal documents that are not expired. Um, they should all be laid out and ready to go. That helps you. That helps the student. That helps set the tone. The next big one is the aircraft. And you've probably flown a lot more types of aircraft than the listeners from single engine trainers and general aviation. Um, you you know that an aircraft has a, a myriad of options in it. Yeah. And they need to, the student in their CFI, and if it's a, a, a good flight school, they will help that student as well. But they need to make sure that that airplane is ready to go. 
from. Yeah. Yeah. We all know the acronym AVA. That's a big part of it. And they should days before, if not the day before, not the day of the check ride, but the day before or weeks before, make sure they understand the, the, the log books for that aircraft and that they know where to find the annual sticker and, and that the annual was completed. Um, and all that stuff should be tabbed out in those books. They should have those books in the exam room where you're meeting them tabbed out, ready to go as well. It shouldn't be a, Hey, I'm Wally. Hey, I'm the applicant. Um, can you run and get the log books? Like every little piece of setback I would think would begin to create some anxiety for the examiner as well going, yeah, this is not going to get this. We're just never going to get done in time and this isn't going very well. Right. Right. Um, you know, one, one thing, uh, I, I feel like a lot of the applicants, um, when it comes to looking in the log books, the aircraft log books, um, I feel like this is the first time they've done that. And, uh, case and I, I i did a check ride last month and uh i asked the young man to show me an un, uh, show me an airworthy airplane and and as he was looking through the 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 check ride happened to be on november 30th um as he was looking through the log book um he showed me an annual which was dated uh november of the of last year it, it, the check ride was on november 30th 2020 and the annual that he showed me was it was done in uh, November 19th, I believe, 2019. And uh, I, I said to him, I said, is this, is, is this, this is the latest annual? He said, yeah, it's legal. And I said, yeah, I, I know it's legal, but it's two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, the airplane's legal for about another 10 hours. I said, suppose we uh, end up at another airport and we have a uh, mechanical issue. Uh, you know, the flight school is going to have a ferry permit to get the airplane back. I said that, and it, it, it was a, um, uh, you know, I said it, it doesn't quite pass the smell test for me. And then he actually kind of, uh, dug deeper and said, Oh, Oh, here's, here's an annual that was done 11, uh, of 2020. And I, okay, now that's, that's the annual that we're looking for. Um, and you know, there's, there's, um, confusion about where to find the annual. You know, a lot of these airplanes have three log books. There's a, there's an aircraft or an airframe log book. There's an engine log book and, um, maybe even a propeller log book. Um, so, you know, they're in the engine log book looking for the annual, which you're not going to find it there. It's <laughs> going to be in the airframe or the aircraft log book. Um, and then, um, you know, if you think of the annual as being the airplane and you think of a hundred hour as being the engine, um, that, that sort of helps because that's where you're going to find the hundred hour stuff in the engine log book and, uh, the annual in the aircraft log book or the airframe log book. Um, and, and some airplanes actually will have a, a fourth log book for avionics. So one thing that I think I reflect on from my check ride day was this discussion around ADs. And I know I learned about ADs. Well, I take that back. I know I was taught about ADs. I don't know that I actually learned much. I, I, I don't think I took it all in. Uh, now, as a fly school owner, I'm very astute and know a lot more about airworthiness directives. Um you you tell me uh, the way you describe them. I think it was the best way I've ever heard it, and I only heard that today. What is an airworthiness directive, Wally? Well, I, it's basically a recall on the airplane. In, in a nutshell, just just it's um, uh, the the FAA or the manufacturer, uh, and it could be the airframe, it could be the engine, uh, it could be the avionics or whatever component on the airplane has uh, come up with, uh, you know, uh, that, 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 that there's an issue with the airplane. Uh, something on there needs to be addressed, and it may be something that needs to be addressed uh, immediately. It may be something that needs to be addressed on the next uh, scheduled inspection, uh, may, maybe the next 100 hour, the next annual. Um, uh, and it may be something that needs to be, uh, recurring, you know, every, every 12 months, something needs to be done or every hundred hours, something needs to be done. But, uh, you know, we're all familiar with recalls on cars. We've all gotten the notice on the car and, uh, you know, the, 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 the 
letter in the mail from, from the manufacturer of your car and you open it up and I think we all look at it and say, okay, that's, um, boy, that's a big deal. That's something that maybe we should get addressed tomorrow or, uh, well, okay, maybe, maybe when it's a little bit more convenient and the, and the FAAs, uh, uh, when they issue an AD and airworthiness directive, it's the same thing. Some are critical. Some need to be addressed immediately and some not so much. And I think that's the, the big difference in, in, a, in an aircraft versus a vehicle recall is they, they will have some sort of a time requirement. You know, Ford sends me something on my truck. Um, I kind of can get that done whenever I want to get that done. Right. And they want me to bring it in and get it done because they don't want something worse to happen, of course. That's why they created the recall. Um, but I'm not necessarily required to do it as much as at a flight school, uh, planes that are for rent, um, or higher in any way, there will be a 100-hour or 50-hour requirement more than likely on most airworthiness directives. And I think, and, and they, they all probably get done. I'm sure there's someone shady out there that doesn't do them all, but the mechanic and the, the operator is going to do that, and the flight school owner and or the flight school mechanic will do those things. But the one thing that the pilot in command has to do is also verify that the, the one of those two people said that they did all that before they got in that plane to go fly. And I was overwhelmed, you know, researching airworthiness directives, trying to prepare for my check ride, and seeing these hundreds, maybe even thousands of airworthiness directives on 172s. Like, where do I go to begin? Like, and and I'm afraid that most students just go, well, I'm going to assume that the flight school or Bobby or the mechanic did all that and just go. And in reality, the best way to think of that list is your aircraft probably doesn't by itself have a thousand airworthiness directives, but the collection of that model may, and your model has certain equipment on it. And most of those have probably been superseded. The FAA does this where they supersede something. So it might be, uh, it might be an engine airworthiness directive, but your plane no longer has that engine. So that airworthiness directive doesn't apply. And then if it's been, serviced since then and was done once then it's superseded and doesn't have to be complied with ever again so there's a way that this list of a thousand probably gets chopped down to a half dozen for your aircraft and you you may have one recurring and it's it's probably not something super super dangerous um we have a seat track ad for one of our aircraft that has to be looked at it's got to be examined every 50 hours so a mechanic puts a flashlight in there looks at the seat track checks for the tolerances that the ad says that it needs to be puts a logbook entry in and we're done and that's that's a recurring ad and out of all my fleet i think there's maybe two three of those across the fleet so it's not as overwhelming i think as private students and, and maybe some CFIs make it out to be, yeah. but you as pilot in command have to make sure that those have been complied with. And normally there's a sticker or a logbook entry uh, that you could flag to prove that those have all been handled. Great flight schools like this one, keep a list of those active and unsuper the the 80s that have not been superseded so that a, a DPE and the FAA and a student can quickly see that short list and make sure that they've all been complied with. So um, don't, Assume it's so overwhelming that you can't get it and then ask someone for help. There's probably plenty of senior people around your flight school. There's probably an AD guy or girl who loves it and will walk you through it and make you understand it all. Don't just do it once and never do it again, right? And along those lines, this is going off the, the basically the script of this podcast a little bit, but I think this is something worthwhile. If you do have an airplane that has a time-constrained uh, AD, like you said, a 50-hour uh, for people who own their airplane privately, they're probably thinking, well, I don't need to do a 100-hour. I don't need to do a 50-hour. The airplane is not operated for for hire. Well, uh, that's a true statement, but if, if the AD states a time constraint and you go over that in a year um, to actually be compliant, you do need to comply with that AD. For so sure. it's something to look at. And I, I'm sure there are a lot of ADs that like are like that that are annual, have to be done as part of an annual inspection or something as well. But make sure you understand that if you are the owner and operator of that, that aircraft, it could, could hurt you in the future. Um, we talked about a bunch of documents for the person. I think it makes a lot of sense. 
for a student to take the time to do all that review, maybe make Xerox copies of those logbook entries, again, highlighted, tabbed out, ready to go for you, but to summarize all that and, and have the logbook sitting right next to it so that you could see the summarization, open the logbook, verify it, check it, do your part to qualify the aircraft before you go. Um, I think we mentioned this on one other show in the past, but a, a good trick for the aircraft would be to have a copy of the registration sticker and the airworthiness yeah. certificate yeah. in that room as well. Yeah, You'll obviously verify it at the aircraft later, but does that suffice for you in that room to yeah, qualify that aircraft? Definitely. The, the one thing I hate to see, I unless it's a privately owned airplane, um, and nobody else is going to fly it. I, I hate when I go to a flight school and somebody has gone out to the airplane and taken the registration and the airworthiness certificate and brought it into the room for me. Uh, I, I appreciate the effort. I really do. But I'm always scared that that airplane's going to go fly while we're sitting there doing the ground portion. So uh, if I see that, I, I usually, as soon as I see it, I have the applicant. Uh, take it back to the airplane, put it back in the airplane. Same with the POH. Um, You know, um, in my uh, letter, I encourage people to have, I I think the letter actually says a copy of the POH. Um, And so I don't actually mean the POH out of the exact airplane because it's not unusual for us to to schedule a check right at 8 o'clock. We're not going to get in the airplane until about 10 or 10.30 and uh, uh, the airplane has a, a two-hour flight at, at 8 to 10 uh, before us, and uh, the applicant gets there at 7 in the morning to get the room all nice and ready, and, and they go out and they grab the POH of, from the airplane, and then the next person um, who has that airplane rented jumps in and uh, maybe doesn't notice that something's missing, and they take off, and so they're they're not quite in compliant with the regulations. So... Uh, you know, keep the stuff in the airplane that should stay in the airplane, but uh, just really just just snap a picture with your phone and, and print it out, and uh, that that makes things go fairly smooth. Yeah, as a flight school owner, please don't reserve that plane for four hours for a 1.4 private pilot check ride. I would really like that aircraft to get flown, um, and it needs what it needs to be legal while it's flying. So have a copy. Uh, most flight schools would have a pilot information manual, which is a representation of that POH that can be used for check ride purposes, study purposes, etc. So we've told we've we've shared a lot of little tips and tricks, but to to quickly recap, as the as you're qualifying the pilot, all the documents laid out, ready to go, follow a checklist. If you don't have one, we'll have one for you soon. Uh, legal documents, all non-expired legal documents laid out, ready to go. This could be easily put in a notebook with a couple tabs that said pilot, aircraft, all this stuff laid out. Um, make sure that you you have all the things for the aircraft, logbooks in the room. Logbooks don't have to be in the aircraft, should not be in the aircraft, so they'll be available for you to have in that room. And then a copy of the airworthiness certificate, the registration, other things that you might want to point to in the logbook, but be available to the DP. All that stuff collectively together, nice and organized, ready to go before you got there, is going to set the tone for a really good check ride. Yeah. For sure. It is. And probably the, the third thing is have the ability to log into IACRA. Don't wait till the morning of or the the day of of the check ride to try to log in the, into IACRA. I joke that you know we're all going to die. Um, I, I hate to sound morbid here, but but it's a fact. We are all going to die. And and I joke that when I was in college, a um, uh, bunch of friends and I decided to go to a movie. This is back in the eighties um, to give you an idea. And uh, somebody said, "Hey, we're going to go see uh, this movie," and it was called Ernest Goes to Camp. And uh, I went with a bunch of guys, there were probably about eight of us, and I remember sitting in this movie thinking to myself, this is the absolute worst movie I have ever seen in my life. And and uh, we left, we were walking out, and I just I just remember, I, I remember saying to my buddies, I said, man, that movie was horrible. And, and they all agreed that it was horrible. And we all looked at each other and said, well, why didn't we get up and leave? And, and everybody said, well, I thought, I, thought you were, I thought you were enjoying it. 
And and I, I joke that at some point I'm going to be lying on my deathbed and and I'm going to wish I had those two hours of my life back where I sat in that movie of Ernest Goes to Camp. Well, I feel the same way with is watching applicants trying to log into IACRA. I have spent hours of my life uh, watching applicants sitting across from me with my computer or their computer saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, wrong password. And of course, with, with the IACRA system, if you try to log into it uh, too many times, it'll lock you out. And now you're, you're making a phone call and talking to the, I, the IACRA help desk people, who are very helpful, by the way. But uh, it's, you know, I try to calm the applicant down. I say, it's okay, it's all right, don't worry about it, we'll get through this. But I see the blood pressure rising on the applicant right there and and you know it's this should be something fairly easy so you know the day before your check ride log into IACRA make sure everything's there um uh you know it'll tell you if, if it wants you to change your password it will um it will tell you that your password's going to expire at the end of the day today or or whenever and if that's the case make the appropriate changes well i could i could just say it i mean do a dry run with your cfi Ask the chief of your flight school to do a dry run check ride. Make sure all that stuff's done. Go through all those processes. Um, print out your I- IACRA stuff. That would help as well. Um, but don't don't wait and log in for the first time in six weeks for yeah. the day of the check ride. Make sure you're logged in for sure. That That is another thing. Occasionally, IACRA does go down for maintenance. Um, in fact, it was down uh, just this past Tuesday. And... Um, uh, uh, it was down for a couple of hours and I, I was in the middle of a check ride. We were able to get into it before it went down and then we finished it when it had come back up. So it didn't really affect us. But, uh, one thing that you can do is, and you should do is go ahead and print your, uh, your application, which we call the 8710. It's the 8710 form. Just print that out and have a hard copy of it. So if we get to the check ride and for whatever reason, IACRA is down that day, we have the ability to switch to a paper check ride, which creates a few more issues, but it's doable. It's very doable. But if we don't have the application, um, it kind of creates some issues. I guess the last few tips and tricks or best practices that we've we've talked about on the show and off the show, but uh, if I have a logbook, I better sign every page of that logbook. I should have those totals totaled, totaled up. Yeah. I recommend if people are using a paper logbook that you use a, a paper logbook, but the total should be in pencil because you're going to make mistakes. And if you use a pen, total should be in pencil. Uh, that'll save you some, some, some heartbreak. I can assure you. Um, if I'm using for flight, I should print that out. My yeah. logbook out, sign all those pages. Yeah. Obviously, ForeFlight does all that for you or makes it available for you so that you can sign all those pages as well. Endorsements. Man, don't make this hard on the DPE. If you have those endorsements, if you've been endorsed to take the check ride, he, he or she's going to need to see that. Have that printed out, put in your either in your notebook or out on the desk, but have the logbook there yeah. available for the DPE. Um, ForeFlight can make that easier, but can make it more complicated if you – can't get on Wi-Fi, didn't download all that information, haven't printed it, et cetera, um, you, your thought process going into that should be, I'm going to make this as easy as I can for both myself and this designated pilot examiner so that this goes as good as possible. Right. And I can't tell you how many times we're helping students get get a glue stick to log a endorsement in their logbook that the CFI sent to them in four flight and it's not – it's not this or it's not that. I mean, it's just, it doesn't make anybody feel good about the way that the day is going to go for sure. So right. knock all that stuff out before right. any closing thoughts as we finish our first check ride turbulence episode, uh, titled preparing for a check ride. I would say this, um, ground school is required to be logged. And, uh, I, I need to see, a, uh, uh, some record of some ground school as an examiner, uh, not, it's not uh, real um, uh, specific, but we do need to see some uh, uh, ground school logged. And uh, at least around here, the instructors are getting pretty good. I haven't run into any uh, in quite a while, but um, uh, that, that has been an issue in the past. Well, hopefully this helps you a whole bunch. Hopefully, if you have a check ride in the short 
term horizon. You'll use all these tips and tricks no matter who your DPE is. I know it's going to help you. As always, until you listen to the next show, fly safe and stay behind the prop. Thanks for checking out the Behind the Prop podcast. Be sure to click subscribe and check us out online at BehindTheProp.com. Behind the Prop is recorded in Houston, Texas. Creator and host is Bobby Doss. Co-host is Wally Mulhern. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not meant to replace actual flight instruction. Thanks for listening and remember, fly safe.